And good morning, everyone. Um, I hope you're enjoying the program as much as I am this morning. Um, I am a JFN member and, and have served on the planning committee for today's uh, conference. In this workshop, we want to discuss our West Coast Jewish organizations, specifically where were we pre-COVID? What has been the impact of the crises? Where are we now and where are we headed? Help us remember how far we have come in the last nine months. I want to give uh, my own personal journey that I think helps illustrate a shift in mindset that many organizations, boards, and donors are exhibiting. On March 9th, I was hosting Anad Hoffman, an executive director of the Israel Religious Action Center and founder of Women of the Wall. Her talk was the last live in-person event at the Ashman JCC. In retrospect, we were very lucky to even host this event. It became alarmingly clear that our circumstances were changing rapidly. In the following couple of weeks, uh, decisions were made reluctantly and with great stress. And when we look back at these decisions now, they seemed obvious. Why, why were we having such a difficult time dealing with this new reality? How many of us thought that the initial shutdown would be over by Passover? And then Passover came and went, and so did Shavuot. Schools were out till the fall. Camp was canceled. And then we had the horrendous death of George Floyd and the fires that once again consumed much of our West. In March and April, my anxiety was off the chart and growing. COVID was an existential threat to so many of our organizations, the ones that I cared deeply about. And my basic instinct was to take action. My calls to CEOs and CFOs had me ranting, cut, borrow, beg for funds so that we could all survive to reimagine a new world post COVID. And for goodness sakes, do it right now. This is what uh, Stanford D School professor Lisa K. Solomon would describe as survival anxiety, the equivalent of a fight or flight response for organizational leaders and funders. Luckily for them and for me, Andre Spokoini asked me to participate in a scenario planning exercise. These sessions helped me to channel my anxious energy and transform it into what Lisa Solomon terms learning anxiety, an anxiety that can see possibility and learn from the stress to reimagine a future. Of course, the fires added uh, for me some real PTSD. And yet when I looked at the fires and, I, and that terrible sky, I also reminded me that our West Coast organizations are resilient, that we have suffered loss and we are able to transform. Fast forward to today, uh, quite frankly, my anxiety level is still high, but I have a different mindset. It is one that is more curious, more appreciative and open to learning. Though the threats are still exceptionally real I hope that I am more constructive and creative as a funder and board member to each of the organizations I support. For the next 20 minutes uh, or so, we are going to briefly look at three organizational sectors in our community and consider how each of these organizations have addressed the initial survival threat and how they are now coping with the complexity complexity and fluidity of the pandemic so that they are able to emerge and reimagined and hopefully stronger. So let me turn the uh, Zoom spotlight now to Tamara Abrams, one of my fellow planning committee members who with Zach Bodner, CEO of the Oshman JCC, 
will discuss how the JCCs have reacted and what the future might hold. Hi, thank you. Um, it's really nice to be here with you today. Um, my name is Tamara Abrams and I manage my family's small charitable foundation. I was asked to talk about JCCs, the Jewish Community Centers, um, which is one of our foundation's uh, primary areas focused for giving. I'm drawn to JCCs because of their unique position as community builders. They strengthen connections among people with established Jewish identities, as well as those who are questioning or less connected. I believe that as donors, if we want to ensure Jewish continuity, the JCCs provide a huge open tent that can bring in everyone to explore and connect. They also provide a bridge to the Jewish world for non-Jewish community members. Prior to COVID, JCCs had an enviable and unusual nonprofit model designed to ensure sustainability. Their budgets were mostly funded from earned income, anywhere from 75 to 90 percent, which is a lot. Before the pandemic, their buildings were full with children in preschool, after school and camp, arts and culture, swimming, gym, and other wellness offerings. Unfortunately, this revenue model was suddenly a liability when everything was shut down at the start of the pandemic, sometimes literally in a day. The vibrant preschool, after school, and summer camp, camp programs ended. Cafes, gyms, and pools were shuttered. As a result of the income loss, the majority of staff were furloughed or laid off. For example, the JCC in San Francisco had to furlough 70% of its 350 staff. The four Bay Area JCCs collectively furloughed or laid off 700 employees. Some JCCs cut senior staff compensation by 10 to 40%. Overall budgets were slashed. The JCCs were faced with much uncertainty at the beginning of the pandemic. If they wanted to maintain their ability to reopen for the summer, they had to retain enough staff, which meant running budgets at deficits. The small remaining staff had to figure out how to provide community services online, how to be ready to open for the summer and fall, how to keep families and kids connected, how to ensure that seniors weren't isolated. My primary experiences with the JCC in the East Bay, of which I'm on the board, but I suspect their approach is shared by many others. They developed a startup mentality Already a lean organization, they cut to the bone and deployed staff in many new ways. They were inventive and creative. They took on multiple jobs. For example, the CEO in the Berkeley JCC also became the marketing director and the human resources director. Not recommending that, but that's what happened. They made it work. They responded to the community need for attention to families with children. They called seniors. They experimented with various online programming. The JCCs locally and nationally shared online arts and culture events like armchair traveling or cooking demos. Many were able to open for child programming on a limited basis for the summer just to break even. The Jewish community stepped in with emergency funding and many JCCs also were able to use PP money, PPP money to stay afloat. But just as they reopened, as we know, the fires roared in and the smoke descended on us. Again, they were forced to close, to return summer camp tuition, to furlough staff. It was a disaster of a summer. As the Jewish institutions with the largest collective reach in, in terms of Jewish people served, I believe this is a potentially catastrophic moment. The emergency funding that has become so generous is just not sustainable. So here's my view on this moment. Our Jewish parents and grandparents built these institutions so that we would have places to connect to meet and to learn. And now it's our turn. I was asked to give some thoughts on the future of JCCs. Um, if you know, please tell me. But let's face it, Zoom is just not a substitute for our kids creating a menorah together or sitting in an audience and feeling the music wash over us. I do know that the JCCs are in a precarious position. We're going to need the buildings and the staffing to be a place for gathering again to be a first point of contact for many people who aren't already connected to a synagogue or other organization. What is the new model for sustainability? What will they keep? Should Jewish community agencies consolidate or share resources? How do we as funders support them? I look forward to learning together in our breakout session on exploring these questions and sharing ideas. And now I'd like to welcome Julie Platt to talk about youth program programs, uh, in particular Jewish camps. Julie? Thank you. Sure. 
First, let me just thank Alex Shabtai uh, for her earlier comments, shedding light on Jewish camping. Uh, and to highlight the fact that the Glazer Foundation has made a wonderful commitment to Jewish camping. There is an active collaboration locally in LA with the Federation, the Jewish Community Foundation and the Glazer Foundation. And I know Alex would want me to encourage others to join this effort to support Jewish camping. So let me try to capture the state of Jewish camping very quickly. It's still pouring. We are in the middle of the rainy day. Camps have had to downsize personnel and reduce costs significantly, which makes the reopening even more challenging. We imagine that camper capacity will be limited this summer. We predict perhaps 60% and costs to operate will remain high as larger numbers of staff will be needed for additional cleaning and medical staff, equipment, testing, everything you can imagine to safely reopen. Camps will still definitely need general operating funds. Beyond the camps that burned down and their challenges in rebuilding, many of our camps have been engaged or are about to engage in capital projects. Specifically this summer, there is a conversation about quickly building up bunk capacity to take on more campers if the camps will be restricted to 60% of overall capacity. Due to COVID, fear, reduced camp capacity, and loss of summer 2020, there is a risk we feel of losing an entire class of first-time new campers, which will impact the pipeline over the next few years. Some communities are reducing one happy camper first-year incentives to put more funds in need-based financial aid, which will ultimately lead, we fear, to fewer first-time families. That worries us, and it has to be and and not or. We need the incentivization and the scholarships. There is continued impact from the fires on the three camps. Not only are these camps facing a deficit from this immediately past summer, but they've been operating at a deficit since the fires. They need capital campaigns in addition to raising funds to use rental spaces. And this summer, we believe there will be fewer spaces available for rent and costs will be high. There is a lack of clarity on what will be permitted by the state for summer 2021 and of course across the country. California has not issued guidelines of any sort for overnight camps. And while camps truly believe they will be able to operate confidently, Ultimately, they can't open until we have the guidelines. There is a growing non-sectarian lobbying and advocacy effort that obviously could use more funding and attention. Foundation for Jewish Camp, of which I chair that board, is collaborating closely with the ACA, the American Camping Association, on this and basically everything, all Jewish camping. There is a growing local interest in day camps. Since the states allowed day camps to open, there is growing interest to build up that area. Partnerships could be really critical here, especially in Los Angeles, where there is one typical JCC day camp and many smaller synagogue based day camps that are struggling with what to do this summer and are part of institutions where the day camp is not necessarily the top priority for that institution. And lastly, let me just highlight talent pipeline. Camps across California have had to downsize significantly and the Foundation for Jewish Camp is in active conversations to renew a previous idea that could be even more powerful in this upcoming summer and years ahead to help build camps staff, build the talent pipeline and provide intensive first care learning opportunities for college graduates to incentivize their participation. If Shlichim are not able to come in the numbers previously, though we are also advocating intensely with the Jewish agency on the J-1 visa issue, we will really have to innovatively attract staff domestically and FJC is also focused here. So I know this is a lot, 
and I hope we'll be able to um, explore it more in the breakouts that Margalit and I will lead. But let me end by saying thank you to every funder who has saved the field since the beginning of the pandemic until now, and I hope on into the future. Let me now um, transition into a video from Adine Sachs. Thank you. Very big fun that was started by two artists and creatives. And they really are curious about Judaism's ability to be expansive, inclusive, and push the boundaries of how we think about ourselves and our identities. I am Shana Trubosser. I'm a senior program officer for the Righteous Persons Foundation. We also have artists who are our funders. Um, Steven Spielberg and his wife, Kate Capshaw, started the Righteous Persons Foundation after Steven made the film Schindler's List. And so we've really always, um, always, always taken the power of story and telling stories um, as really core to our mission. We have supported arts and culture over 26 years now um, and just couldn't be prouder to help artists and the arts um, as you said, help us make meaning of, of our lives and our world. So. so the other hat that Shane and I are wearing today is that we're both partners of a new effort called Canvas. Um, and Canvas is a partnership between funders, artists, Jewish cultural networks and organizations who are working to support the emergence of a Jewish cultural renaissance. And that sounds, especially in this moment, like a, a crazy dream. But I would say that, um, that that dream is real, even in this moment. Um, but unfortunately, we have to kind of bring you into the realities that our, our sector of Jewish arts and culture is facing today. So I think it won't come as a surprise to anyone in this circle about the con consequences that the pandemic is playing on so many parts of our lives and the cultural institutions and the artists um, that we care about are no exception. And their livelihoods, <clears throat> their livelihoods have been pretty devastated and not just the artists, but also the institutions and like in general, the creative industries that support our ability to dream about our future are really facing dire, dire consequences. And you're seeing some of the numbers put up on um, the slides here. Um, so, yeah, so that is, that's the world that we're in right now, and it's very far from the world where we want to be in. Um, but we also are living our lives in this moment, and I'm curious, Shana, if you'll speak to, yeah, what, what's been your experience both in your life and also in your work as you think about the delta between what Jewish artists bring and also what we're facing today? Um, so I'm, I'm so struck seeing those numbers. I mean, I think that we've heard some of that pain reflected in conversations, right, with the organizations that we all support. Um, so it, it comes as no surprise. And yet, I'm also really struck by the fact that artists over these past eight months that we've all been dealing with COVID and the various impacts that it's having on our communities, they have continued to create, they have continued, like they have dug deep and given us all so much inspiration. I'm thinking about Saturday Night Seder, that reboot, um, and the incredible, you know, group of creative people that are part of that network put out for Passover this year. And I, they had millions of people tuned in to get to have this new creative artistic Seder and to feel connected to one another. And what a gift that was um, for all of us at the very beginning of, you know, these lockdowns. Um, I'm thinking about the PJ Library books that keep showing up and have given my kids who are small um, that continued sense of normalcy. Um, and I'm also thinking about, I'll throw out one other thing, which is um, Unorthodox, a show that my husband and I just like blew through in a matter of, I want to say it was like two days um, over the summer and what an incredible, like entertaining distraction that was. And like, what an incredible invitation also to like really think deep about 
our own Jewish practice and experience and community looks like. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm grateful um, for all the ways that Jewish culture has continued to touch our lives. What about you? Yeah, actually the image that came to my mind in this moment is that my parents have been um, taking part, the Israel Fund is doing this incredible film, film club where the filmmakers come and speak. And uh, just that thought that their isolation has been penetrated by film and that connection with others who are talking about identity, like I'm getting choked up. <laughs> um, it's really amazing that that has been a lifeline for them and a connective tissue back to community and identity. Um, so I, I think that this crowd will see that the two of us really are convinced, like we see artists as essential workers. We need artists to be telling us what this moment means and to be really creating pathways for conversation and connection. Um, and I just would ask, you know, we have probably another minute to say this, but I would just ask you to join us. Um, you know, please support the artists in your life, the cultural institutions in your life and join us at Canvas so that we can really uh, be where we're at in this pandemic moment, but also reach that aspirational place where we really are in a Jewish cultural renaissance and that artists have uh, center stage in our conversations about the future of the Jewish community. So uh, let's just take a few minutes and see if we can go around the proverbial breakout room. Um, who wants to speak uh, for, let's see, JCCs. I think we had two or three groups. Um, David, you're gonna have to help me here. Um, uh, I know Tamara was in the one I was in. So maybe Tamara, do you wanna give just one or two highlights of what funders were thinking about and investigating? Sure. So in our group, um, one of the funders said that they really prioritized early childhood education because the families desperately needed that. And so they, when faced with all the different needs, they focused on that and they got group, a larger group of funders together um, to give um, a a more money for that. Um, another one had added um, some older ages uh, for campers to bring for the a revenue model. And also mm -hmm. the funders talked about giving unrestricted funds as being really important. Right, thank you. Um, why don't we go to Zach Bodner, um, who was in the other JCC group. Thanks, Daryl. Yeah, I'll just add that there was energy around this idea of collaboration. How can JCCs do better to work together? How can we maybe eliminate some back office duplication, whether it's here in the Bay Area or JCCs as a whole, but there was excitement and energy around working together, collaborating. Um, and, and then there was also a question about whether the fitness model is the future model for JCCs major business drivers. But otherwise it was a great group of friends. We all know each other, love each other and um, are very familiar with each other. So thanks, Daryl. Great. Um, how about if we go next to Julie um, and one of our camp? Com sure. Camp um, I would say two things that I um, would mention. One is Doug Kahn made a great suggestion, which is that we do a JFN um, visiting tour of Jewish summer camp, which I would just love to do, but mention to him that we will probably not be able to go until summer 2022, because they will probably want us to stay very safe and potted this summer. And the other Wendy Verva mentioned, and I think important also based on all of today's conversations that DEI must be a part of the summer camp uh, world, both in training and in population to reflect our broader Jewish community. Amen. Uh, Margalit, please. Hi, thank you. Um, we talked also about inclusion and DEI and um, inclusion of kids with special needs and disabilities and how regardless of how camps are struggling that those are really still priorities and we have um, DEI projects starting up in the Bay Area with camps and in Southern California. So California is really gonna be a leader in that. Um, and we talked about family camp and how powerful that can be for the talent pipeline, but that without that this year in California, um, how to address the talent pipeline through virtual content and this and the continued need for resources to make that virtual content and virtual activities happen because those still require staffing and maybe at home boxed activities and uh, the camps could really still use some help in that area as well. 
Love it. Um, Luke Hove, please. Sure. Our, um, our group was talking about arts and culture, and we covered uh, in a little bit of time a lot of topics, including the existential crisis that artists are experiencing right now. You saw some of the numbers that Aideen and, and Shana had shared at the beginning. Uh, and the need still, uh, in spite of all that, for to focus on investing in excellence uh, and not settling for less quality simply because the work is Jewish. Um, there was uh, some talk about arts education and arts education, both as, as a means unto itself, but also as a way to engage students that are on the margins and keep them engaged. Um, and that became kind of a, a broader discussion about the role of arts, not just uh, in arts education, but in education writ large. Um, and finally, we talked about arts um, as a means to a, broad, a vibrant Jewish community. And uh, we heard from the Jewish Communal Foundation of Los Angeles, which is actually thinking deeply about the ways in which you build a vibrant Jewish community and the ways in which arts and culture can really be integrated into that to make it possible. You each have be heard some very um, significant need, but also significant opportunity to further engage with uh, three sectors of our Jewish community. Obviously there are many, we couldn't bring every sector today and there are many others. And what's clear is that as funders, we can help lead, um, we can help, um, help sustain our organizations that we care deeply about as we continue to navigate very uncertain and unclear um, uh, waters, but we can do so from a, uh, a view of partnership, of collaboration, of not having all the answers and really being proactive in giving now um, when there's real significant shortfall um, so that our organizations can exist in a more full and, and hopefully in-person manner in the future. Thank you so much, Daryl. Uh, my name is Deborah Feldstein, for those of you who I do not know, and I am the Associate Director for JFN West. Uh, I wanna thank you, Daryl, for your uh, amazing leadership of uh, this portion of the program, and also to thank Julie, Tamara, Edine, Shana, Lou, Zach, and Margalit for your contributions um, as we just begin what we know is an important conversation that we all need to continue.